I'd like to welcome you all again. This is our uh, sixth current issue of an Irish media seminar series. And as you know, the whole point of this module is to bring in um, professional journalists and editors to talk to you about what they feel are uh, the main issues, current issues in Irish journalism at the moment. And also to give you some advice on you know, what editors are looking for when you're all going looking for, for jobs. I'm actually very, uh, I'm delighted to hear that three or four of you have jobs already at this time without the semester being finished. So I think that's a great a testament to your own skills and your own ability and how you impressed uh, editors when you were out on work placement. Uh, I'm delighted today uh, that John Walsh, who's the deputy editor and business editor of the Ireland edition of The Times, uh, is here to talk to you um, about his own experience as a journalist and in particular, he's going to talk to you about uh, the media's role in uh, predicting the last uh, current e economic crisis that we've come through. Um, John is going to talk to you about that. He's also going to talk to you about business journalism and how uh, the whole model of business journalism, journalism has changed with the recession and how business has become uh, mainstream news and front page news and how that's going to be important for all of you when you go out uh, in your careers. Uh, John has a lot of experience as a business journalist. He was the editor of Business and Finance magazine uh, from March 2008 to July 2012. Then he became the business editor of the Irish Examiner from July 2012 to April 2015. And he is now, uh, since then, he is the deputy editor and the business editor of the Ireland edition of the Times. So I'd like to give him a warm welcome. Hi, um, as you can probably tell, um, <coughs> the more this lecture goes on, uh, I actually uh, forgot about it until yesterday, even though we agreed months ago. <laughs> but uh, I was just so busy um, that, uh, like it was yesterday, it came up in my diary and I went, oh shit. Um, <laughs> so. I have quite a lot to say, but it might be a bit scattergun, and uh, like I'll try and get everything in as coherent a fashion as possible. Um, but if you have any questions during it or indeed after, just let me know. Uh, and I'd just like to correct uh, one thing Mary said. Um, I'll talk about the business uh, media's absolute failure to predict the uh, economic crisis. Uh, rather than our role. Okay, yeah. Well, they did fail, yeah. I wasn't exactly sure. <coughs> well, I think it was uh, a wider a wider media failure. Um, but I, I, what I'll do is I'll just spend a, a small bit of time talking about uh, journalism and business journalism. And um, How many people here know the uh, Newswire Reuters? Uh, I, I mean, I worked, I was in London for seven years before I, I moved back and um, other places I've worked in, um, or I've worked in Reuters. I also did a stint with the Financial Times, and back in Ireland I've worked for uh, uh, Panorama, and uh, I covered the crisis for the Daily Telegraph as well. Um, but Reuters is actually, if you're looking at for the very start of business journalism, how it came about, about it's actually Reuters, which is a news agency. Um, and it was literally just people delivering prices, stock prices. Um, and that was the first reporting. And then it developed, um, that would have been the very, very early 19th century. Um, and it developed like that, basically just delivering stock prices, things like that. Um, and then as the economy, as people became more interested in markets, um, it developed. Um, and there's actually an Irish guy who's probably instrumental in the development of modern day business journalism. Um, and that's a guy called Brendan Bracken. He was uh, quite a fascinating character. He was uh, Winston Churchill's right hand man. Uh, he was the first, he was the Minister for Information during the Second World War. Uh, but he's from Tipperary. You know the GEA club, uh, J.K. Brackens? Uh, well, that was his father. Um, but Brendan Bracken was uh, this guy who, uh, at the age of 14, was sent to Australia, but got this idea that he should become an upper-class British gentleman um, and 
moved back to England at the age of 18 uh, and claimed that he was from the land of gentry and used to walk around the place with this upper class British accent. Uh, but like London society bought into him. Um, like he was, he was obviously a genius, but a complete spoofer as well. Um, and like got this English public school tie and went around and said, oh, I went to Sedberg. Um, and just became accepted. But he started off as a journalist, um, and he got a job in this newspaper called Financial News, which is a very specialist newspaper that just covered the city of London. Um, but met Winston Churchill at a party, uh, and Churchill became absolutely besotted with him. Uh, just you know, couldn't get over this guy. You know, he'd a brilliant turn of phrase and was really funny and. Churchill and himself became inseparable, and through Churchill he became, made a lot of contacts and he met this publisher, and he persuaded this guy to put up the money to buy, um, buy this publication that was failing, even though it had been around a long time. Uh, this newspaper called the Financial Times <coughs> was just about to go out of business, and Bracken persuaded this publisher to buy it and merge it with Financial News. And the very distinctive thing about the Financial Times is that it was printed in pink newspaper. So he made the merged newspaper pink. And that publication, which became known as the Financial Times, was possibly the first you know, publication that was devoted to the economy, the stock market, and so on. Um, but all the way through, I mean, for subsequent decades, it was still a very kind of marginal publication. And um, only people who were interested in the city and um, how stock market worked, markets worked and so on were interested in it. Um, but then interesting things started happening. Um, from the 1950s onwards, you know, after the Second World War, um, the Americans, you know, the US became one of the dominant world powers. But intrinsic in U.S. Um, democracy, or the makeup of U.S. democracy, was disbelief in the markets and how the markets worked. Um, you know, ultimately it defined everything. You know, it was this um, acceptance of capitalism as being the defining order of everyday existence of how the economy uh, it was shaped by market forces, and you accepted that and became the cornerstone of liberal democracy. Um, and that was, you know, like the U.S. style versus communism. What defined to be an American was disbelief in the market, disbelief in capitalism. And uh, there's a very interesting subplot here that brings me up to my own start as a trainee journalist uh, in 1998. In, from the 1950s onwards, serious, I mean, academics started putting, really started concentrating on how the markets worked. Because there's... One thing nobody wanted to admit was that you have this thing, you have the markets. It's basically ordering our everyday existence. Um, but the one thing that the US government could never come out and admit is that nobody idea, had any idea how the markets actually worked. Um, nobody could tell from one day to the next whether markets would go up, whether they would go down. And they had academics, you know, from all different backgrounds, scientists, everything, looking at market graphs every day and saying, is there any order to this? Can we make any sense to it? Um, and nobody could. But it was also something that nobody could ever admit. Because if you had just persuaded half the world to buy into this system, um, you couldn't very well turn around and say, by the way, we, we don't actually have any idea how it works. Um, so then, you know, there was... You know, a lot of theories came out, some of them actually quite hilarious. Um, like there was one economist who came up with this idea that you could put these equations together and you could look at people who were traders uh, and you could try and legislate for them. And apparently you'd look at somebody's background and uh, if somebody was prone to gambling and being erratic and so on, um, they got a top score and, you know, like a high level of volatility was put into this equation. And then when they started looking at people, the type of people that went into the markets uh, in the States, they came from three basic backgrounds, Irish, Jewish, and Anglo-Saxon. So they gave Irish top score in terms of volatility, in terms of being prone to like, 
of madness and you know whatever. And <laughs> any time there was an Irish trade or a trading room that had a lot of Irish people in it, they were always like. Um, but I mean, generally, like most theories, it turned out to be absolute nonsense. But then the resi these two um, academics, um, Merton, uh, Martin Scholes, and uh, uh, Black Black Scholes model. And Martin Scholes is this Harvard economist, and he put, you know, most of his life was dedicated to the, um, how markets worked. And he had this epiphany when he was in holidays in France. He was in a library in, in, in Paris, and he said he looked down on the ground, and just by his foot, there was this unpublished thesis, and it was about a game of bridge. And he had this eureka moment where he was just looking at it, and I don't play bridge, but apparently it's like, it's, you know, one movement is defined by the other. And he had this crazy notion, or this notion that that's how it works. you never be able to describe the markets in their entirety because it's such a series of random events that you'll never be able to tie them all together. But what you can do is tie parts of them. And his idea is that, to say there was an earthquake in the morning, How would that impact the, the markets in general? You don't know. It could be bad, but why is it that some stocks go up? So his idea, just say you had a random event like an earthquake, well then, stocks that get absolutely hammered are insurance companies because they're facing huge payouts. But on the other hand, there are people who benefit, and these are construction companies, because after every earthquake, you know, a lot of construction has to happen. So he came up with this idea of hedging. So if you're a trader, you just look at uh, two stocks that play off each other. In the event something happens, it's good for this company, but it's really bad for that company. So his idea of hedging was that you invest in both of them at the same time. Therefore, you can't lose. Something happens, and you win. But if you put equal amounts of money into both of them, They just cancel each other out. Is that where the hedge your bets comes from? Yeah. So what you do is you do it on margin. And it's this idea that, okay, I want to take a position in this stock, but I'm not going to put all my money into it. I'm going to take a bet that it'll do something in the future. So you put up a margin of 10%. So you say, look, I bet 100 euros on that. Or put 100 euros, but at, at a 10% margin. So realistically, you. put a thousand euros on this, except you only physically put up on 100 euros, and you're taking a punt that at some stage in the future, that's going to pay you back tenfold. So that's where you cover your margin. Um, and if that, if that something happens, bad happens to that company, it's okay, you're covered. Because on the other side of it, you have a stock that follows it. So if something bad happens to this, something that's good, good is going to happen to your other stock. Now, The great and the good bought into this, and it was like, yeah, this makes sense. And it applied to currencies, it applied to bonds, it applied to everything. This hedging strategy, where it was seen as, like, you know, risk, he'd eliminated risk from the markets. And, you know, he set up this fund called Long Term Capital Management. And about five billion went in overnight. You know, all these investors in the US, they all went, we like the sound of this, this sounds really good. Um, So he had about five billion. And then he leveraged it up himself by a factor of 10. So he was 50 billion. And this would have been about 95, 96. Um, and he bet it all. Uh, he actually bet it on, like a, he, he took a huge, huge exposure um, to currency movements. Um, and part of it was the Russian, uh, the Russian ruble. But, The one thing he had never factored in was that the Russian government would devalue the ruble because he was just looking at market movements. And as soon as the Russian government devalued the ruble, his, like, his equations went out the window. Everything, all his assumptions were wrong. So he actually started a market run because he's massive. His losses were so big because you know, he had so much leverage that it triggered a worldwide panic. Um, and the US Federal Reserve had to step in and lower interest rates and bail him out. Um, and it was incredible, this one man who... Why did that happen, John? 
It actually happened. I did a, an MA here in 97. I did my undergrad in UCC. And I did international studies. And I remember uh, reading it. It was in the front of the Observer in 97. You know, a typical uh, observer, like um, kind of uh, overreaction. You know, we're on the precipice of the next Wall Street crash, you know. Like, uh, um, but I mean, like, world authorities, central banks stepped in. But when I left here, I went to London and uh, I got a job at a publishing company. And uh, it was this incisive media, it's a huge publishing company with a load of different magazines. Uh, and I got a job as a trainee journalist on Risk magazine, which none of you would have ever have heard. But if you go to any of the world's major central bankers or big bankers, they all read it. It had a, it had a readership. It used to publish about 5,000 copies every month. But if you wanted to buy an ad in it, one page would cost you between 75,000 sterling and onwards. Because... It was printed for some of the wealthiest men in the world, or you know, like these top-level bankers, and it focused on the futures and derivatives, um, futures and options market, the derivatives. But they had a conference that year, and it was a big conference in Paris. And Orrin <coughs> Scholes turned up. I mean, the previous year he'd uh, send the global economy into a tailspin, so um, he turned up with uh, quite a lot of security guys around him. Um, but basically. Um, blamed everybody else, said it wasn't his uh, model that was wrong, uh, it was actually, uh, you know, the markets got it wrong. So. Um, but that was, that's where I started in journalism, and, and, you know, it was an amazing experience because it was really in the deep end in terms of some of the most opaque parts of the financial markets um, that people don't know exist. Um, extremely, uh, like, they're so behind everyday news and most, people, most people's understanding of how markets and the economy work. Um, but it was good exposure just in terms of trying to get my head around it and then being able to write about it because that's the biggest challenge. No matter what type of journalism you do, the main thing, you, your biggest challenge always will be taking something and delivering it in a format that people want to read and can understand um, and once you can do that, you know, you're doing your job. So very often your first job can be, you know, this is the thing you have to watch out for most. Um, it doesn't matter what you're doing or where you are. It's that skill alone is the one that will stand you in good stead in your subsequent, subsequent career. Um, but you can always trace the evolution of that story <coughs> with the, how business journalism, financial journalism went mainstream because, you know, for most of the 1950s onwards, the stock market existed outside of most people's existence. Very few people, you know, worried every day about how their stocks were doing because very few people were invested in them. Okay, you had pension funds and things like that, but, you know, the wider economy just, it was all about mostly social issues, politics, things like that, a newspaper, you know what I mean, like news, politics, comments, and then a few, one or two uh, pages of business, and uh, unless you're really looking for the business pages, you would have never gone near them. Um, but then in the 1980s, it started opening up, um, you know, where the stock market became more of a, day, uh, a feature of everyday existence. I know it's before your time, but, you know, Thatcherism in Britain, um, Ronald Reagan in the States, you know, they really tried to get people to buy into this. And that's where it started opening up. More and more people became interested. And the cover of, coverage of it became a bit more mainstream, um, but not a huge amount. And then through the 90s, more and more, um, as the economy you know, took more of, this was you know, from the 1990s onwards, um, the economy became, started becoming the story and then we had this boom um, that lasted, certainly in this country, from 1993 onwards, um, you know, until 2007. And the business pages became more mainstream, but for the wrong reason. It's because people started, you know, people had money, they wanted to invest. Um, 
everybody became a bit of a like oh, I wouldn't mind a punt in the stock stock market. I you know I wouldn't mind doing this with my money. I wouldn't mind doing that with my money. And business coverage, you know, companies um, covering companies and so on became a bit more mainstream. So newspapers responded by extending uh, their business coverage, extending, giving more space to business, giving more prominence, <coughs> taking on a lot more business journalists. Um, but the, the nature of business journalism was very interesting because very often, and I wrote about it in the chapter with the crisis, um, in a book that came out a few years ago. I mean, very often it was people with my own background, a general and large degree, who went then and started covering business but it gets back to this whole, whole idea of what is the role of a reporter. Um, were you just reporting on events? Um, you were talking to the experts. You just reported on what they were saying. Um, now, I spent, I was out of this country from 1998 until 2005, <coughs> and I actually missed a lot of the Celtic Tiger. But when I came back in 2005, the one thing that struck me was that there was a consensus here. You know, everybody had this idea that the boom times would last. And anybody that challenged it was, you know, you, you almost cast yourself. Um, it was almost a way of volunteering to become a social outsider. And, you know, people were like, how dare you? How dare you question where the economy is going? The good times are here. And the thing is, people had bought into it. And nobody wanted to hear that this wasn't necessarily going to last, that there was a downside to this, everything that goes up in an elevator usually comes down a mine shaft. Um, but the, um, and that was, it was a very interesting thing, and you know, when you're looking back at you know, the crisis and the role the media played in the crisis, I don't think anybody can, nobody came out of this looking good, the regulators, politicians, bankers, Anybody, the media, um, I mean, we were just having lunch, um, uh, just when I was having lunch before this with Mary, I mean, everybody will have their own story about the crisis, but I mean, mine started in May 2007. I was walking through UCD, and a friend of mine who's an economist in London, he's an Irish guy, um, I, he, was from, he was from Cork as well, um, but he was quite a senior economist in this firm of futures brokers, uh, and they would have dealt with a lot of hedge funds. Um, and he rang me, this is May 2008, and this is the height, like this is the peak of the boom. Um, and there was this belief that the Irish stock, stock market had just hit a record high. Um, there was a bank, Danske Bank, had published this report saying that there were now 50,000 millionaires in Ireland and um, they were just adding people's... 50,000 millionaires? Yeah, God. just if you look at people's, the value of their property, yeah, yeah. you know, their pension portfolios, all that sort of thing, that was, you know, this is... Um, and I remember, like, Charlie McCreevy, or no, like, we were going to Europe and, you know, throwing our no noses at everybody else in Europe, saying, like, this is how it's done, and, you know, follow the paddy trail. Um, the, uh, you know, Charlie McGreevy was going and uh, giving the Germans lectures on uh, how to run your economy. Um, and the thing is, like, I mean, The Economist magazine, um, which is, you know, the definitive publication for, you know, economy, finance, business, um, was loading Ireland through that period. You know, it was like, it actually wrote an editorial saying the Germans should follow the Irish model, uh, which was to deregulate and, um, go to a low tax model um, and in 2000 in May 2007 um, my friend Angus rang and he said look I'm just just to let you know I'm hearing rumours about Anglo-Irish Bank and I said what and uh, he said look I just spoke to a hedge fund guy today and uh, they looked at it and they think they're going to have serious funding problems in the not too distant future uh, and I said like how do you mean and he said look if you look at a lot of their funding, how they're, you know, funding their day-to-day uh, -day lending, it's very short-term. And I was like, oh, right. And so, I mean, I, like my own background, I'm not a banker. I'm not a, you know, I wasn't a finance specialist. Our jobs as reporters was just to report what was happening. And like you'd go to the central bank 
I think it's for the latest figures. You reported, you know, GDP growth. You reported, reported whatever. Go to the Department of Finance. The Finance Minister would come out and say everything is fine. You generally reported what he'd say. You might find one or two dissenting voices. <coughs> you put it together that way. Um, but this is the first time I was confronted with information that was completely outside the narrative at the time. And the narrative is like we might have a few hiccups, there might be a few bumps, but you know, ultimately we'd be fine. But this is the first time that was somebody was coming on and saying, look, your banking system is built on quicksand. Um, and I remember talking to a few experts and saying, look, I, this is what I've heard. Um, is this true? Do you think this is true? Is, is there something in this? And to a person, they're all, no, no, that's rubbish. It's, look, Anglo is fine. Okay, they're borrowing short term. But look at the amount of, look at the volume of money in the world. Who's honestly going to say that that money is going to dry up? We're in the era of globalization. There was money circling around the global economy. So the argument was that suddenly, someday, Anglo would go out and try and tap into that money and it would have disappeared. And like that was what I was hearing back. Uh, and so it was like, chances of this happening are absolutely zero. Interestingly, a few of the people I spoke to suddenly developed 2020 vision because when the crisis happened, they were like, oh yeah, we saw it coming a mile away. Like, we're, we're warning people left, right and center, um, which they weren't. And that's the thing. Um, and it also comes back to what was the role of the media at the time? Certainly for mainstream financial, economic and business journalists, was it our job to you know, lift up the bonnet, get underneath and say, this thing is going to fall apart pretty soon? Um, now the thing is, none of us had the experience or sorry, the expertise or the backgrounds to do this, because to do that, you were taking on, you were going, you are basically contradicting the word of, you know, the central bank, the department of finance, <clears throat> the prevailing wisdom at the time. Then, like, I mean, there is the public interest argument, you know, at what point do you start reporting views that are totally countervailing to the prevailing wisdom? If somebody puts up their hand and says, look, this whole, like we were talking about a classic example is Morgan Kelly. <coughs> he was this UCD economist. And he's generally, in this country, uh, credited as being the first guy that said, um, we're heading for a bust and we're heading for like a pretty serious um, crisis. We're looking at a magnitude of our banking system collapsing, um, <coughs> unemployment shooting up, you know, a massive property collapse. Now, the thing is, this is something that, you know, in your lives, in your careers, you will experience or you will confront with varying degrees of regularity. But this is, what is your role as a journalist? You know, it gets back to the public interest argument. Um, you know, this, do you say, I mean, the media gets accused a lot of sensationalizing things just for the sake of generating headlines. But take a situation like that, when some guy comes out and says the whole thing is going to collapse, what do you do? Do you report it? And knowing that if this guy is wrong, that it could do an awful lot of damage because the economy, big part of the economy is it's built on confidence. So if you publish something that turns out to be completely wrong, and it saps the confidence and you know, it actually has the potential to do a lot of damage, you know, have you done your job as a journalist or what have you done? You know, it's this whole public interest thing. And in looking back now, it was actually a, a debate that probably wasn't aired enough, um, certainly in the media. Um, I think we were caught like rabbits in a headlight. Now, the thing is, the whole thing about Morgan Kelly was quite a nuanced argument because he came up with his thing that the Irish banking system is going to collapse. He said it in 2007, actually quite shortly after I got that phone call. And he said, look, the whole thing is going to fall apart. Um, 
But we, as it was, I rang him as well as a few other journalists, and we said, "Okay, where's your evidence for this? What are you basing this on?" And at the time, he was just made it up, like he was just literally uh, in conversation with a journalist, and he said, "This is what I think is going to happen." But he had absolutely no evidence for it. This was a hunch as such. No, it was reported, um, and it caused an outcry at the time. Uh, I don't suppose very, I think probably very few of you will remember it, but I mean, at the time, it was just it caused this massive. You know, here's this guy, he's talking the economy down, look at the damage he's doing. Um, no, he turned out to be right, but he turned out to be right based on a hunch. And the thing is, as journalists, you are really, you should report the facts. You shouldn't go around reporting people's views when they're based on nothing but a hunch, especially when the stakes are this high. So, <clears throat> I mean, it was really caught between a rock and a hard place. And uh, that case, that particular case, there was no right thing to do um, because you were wrong either way. But then the crisis happened, um, and like everybody, um, like the media was wrong-footed on every occasion. Um, about the depth of the crisis, the durability of the crisis, ultimately what damage would be done. Um, and then on the other side of it, you had this phenomenon where, how many of you know this economist, Nuri Rubini? Uh, he's known as Dr. Doom. Um, well, basically he was a guy at an international level. He was a US economist. He was based in Columbia University. He, uh, in 2007, he was the guy who predicted the global collapse. He was like the global economy is on a precipice, and it doesn't. It, it's not going to take much to nudge it off the edge of the cliff. Uh, and he was right. And the thing about it is, he made absolute millions because he became like this. People paid for him. Uh, like we brought him to Ireland, and I had to pay him fifty thousand euros to speak for one hour. And he was going from us onto a Rome, and um, where he'd get another fifty grand and. You know, he was doing that for a week. His books came out. He was, like the guy made about six, seven million just from appearances and book sales within a relatively short period of time. And then on the other side of the crisis, you know, these guys going, Jesus, what a way to make money. So, like, they were all there like, oh, we're fucked. You know, and, and you know, we were supposed to just report them what he nitty because, you know, people wanted to hear we were fucked. Um, and the thing is, where they were wrong on the way into the crisis, they were also wrong on the way out of the crisis. Because if you look at the amount of people in 2012, 2013, who were basically saying Ireland would never recover, we were looking into a 40-year downturn, that our banking system was you know, basically fucked ad infinitum. And, you know, we'd go back to a barter economy, and emigration would become a way of life again. You know, there would be social disorder. Now, elements of that were right, but on, a, on the greater scheme of things, they were actually quite wrong. I mean, the thing is, the economy has recovered, uh, and it's recovered beyond most people's expectations. I don't think anybody in 2013 would have said that, look at 2018, Ireland would be the fastest growing economy in the world in... Um, or sorry, the fastest growing economy in the EU for three years in a row, um, that unemployment would go from 15.6% down to 6.1%, and it's then falling, and property prices would recover to the extent that they did. Um, and the thing is, the media was so kind of chastened by the experience before the crisis that, I mean, it was very hard to come out and write a story uh, in 2012 or 2013 and uh, to say like things might be that bad you know we could turn the corner because literally you would have been shot and uh, it was like you got it wrong the first time you know like you know whatever so I think the one thing about this crisis it's it's still as yet an unanswered question about the exact role of the media in terms of reporting uh, especially the economy uh, and that's because if you look at most of the people that come to <coughs> journalism, they, they have, by and large, general education backgrounds. You don't go in with armed with the, the expertise to know whether like some central banker or some economist or you know, the minister for finance 
is right or wrong. I mean, you have an idea, but you can't come out and definitively say that's wrong. Um, because if you could, if you had that ability, you wouldn't be a journalist. You'd be working in the markets, making loads of money. Um, so I think that that role, the role of the media, is still to be defined. Um, but that goes alongside um, the general question about where is the media going? Um, I mean, John, would you maybe tell them a little bit about? Um, you know, you were saying there that very few business journalists predicted that the crash. I know you were all very young when the crash. You were all probably twelve with the recession hitting in two thousand. I saw a few of you anyway. Uh, <laughs> sorry, Seamus, I saw you over there. Uh, but just to kind of give it to you in context. I remember it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> But um, you might explain to them, you know what we were talking about before we came in about how some papers like the Irish Times was make, were making huge money out of the property supplements and sort of the difficulty then in, in writing the business stories that might be negative. Well, no, I suppose that's what I was getting on to oh, now, sorry, about yeah. the role of the, you know, the, yeah. the actual model of the journalism itself. Um, because, I mean, if you look at it, you know, up to the period of 2007, um, the internet was there, but it actually wasn't that much of a threat at that stage. Um, media companies were making huge amounts of money, um, and a lot of it was done through advertising, particularly in the property sector. <coughs> so you had this weird relationship that the thing that was, you know, eventually would drive the um, economy over the side of the cliff, which was the property market, that like most of the media were, were reliant on this single sector, because at the time, you picked up the Irish Times on a Friday, and the property supplement was like, you know, up to 20 pages. Um, and I mean, they were making so much money out of this. On the one hand, you had this weird thing where you kind of had a feeling like, you know, how sound is this, you know, ultimately, like all property prices, you know, we've all heard about property crashes. Um, and if you, but the thing is, if you say there's going to be a property crash, eventually there will be a property crash. Um, so a lot of newspapers were very reluctant to go near that around the whole thorny area of um, property. And a lot of it had to do with the fact that they were making so much money off of it. So the whole model of journalism or media also came into question during the crisis because you know, when you're so dependent on advertising, when you're so dependent on one form of advertising, you know, nobody will ever shoot themselves in the foot voluntarily. Um, and there was an element of that. You know, newspapers, why you know, the Irish Times carried that piece by Morgan and Kelly saying we're all fucked. That was one piece. Like the editorial line was very much saying, you know, like the fundamentals of the economy were sound. And generally, they didn't report on alarmist stories about the property market. It was done in common pieces where there was an arm's length between the newspaper and, say, Morgan Kelly. Um, and it comes around to now, like the whole model of media ownership is very much up in the air. Um, you know, like, again, I mean, if you look at up as far as 2007, I draw the analogy between the media industry and the, uh, the music industry. Up until the mid-late 90s, you know, m music companies relied on this thing called the CD. You know, it was like one product, but you made so much money out of it. Um, then along came the internet. You had illegal downloads. And the whole music, the model of the music industry was just totally disrupted. Because you had all these people getting um, their music for free. You know, the CD uh, collapsed. Sales of CDs collapsed. And even the technology around CDs collapsed. You know, people didn't need CD players anymore. Um, and it was like 10 years later, that's what the newspaper industry, no, the music, the music industry reinvented itself said, okay, we don't have CD sales anymore, but, you know, we've loads of other different, you know, there's other different ways of making money. Uh, and that's what the media sector is going to now. 
up until 2007, if you were in print, whether it was a magazine, newspaper, whatever, you had that product, you had your newspaper, and it was a cash cow. You sold your newspapers, but you sold the advertising in it, and you were making a lot of money, and you could fund journalism that way. But then the internet came along and people got their news for free. So suddenly people realized, oh, I don't have to go and buy newspapers anymore. And then advertisers said, well, if people aren't buying newspapers, there's no point advertising in newspapers. So advertising collapsed as well. So this posed a huge challenge for newspapers. What do we do now? And you take the, uh, the Guardian. They took this approach that, OK, um, look, we will build it. You know, it's like make our website for free, offer our news for free. We will just generate traffic. Uh, and the more we generate, the more advertising we get. And that's the model for the future. The only problem with that is that you can't compete with Google and Facebook. You never will. Um, you know, they generate so much traffic. They have so much, they have a global audience. Um, it's impossible. You can't compete with them. And they set the industry standard in terms of how much people can uh, charge for advertising. Um, whereas, I think, if you're looking at non an online advert, it's about one-tenth of what you would pay for the print. So you have to literally uh, generate 10 times the volume online just to stand still. And that's a very hard thing to do. Uh, now, the company I work for, which is um, the Times, the Sunday Times, <coughs> um, we're an, a company within the uh, Murdoch Empire. Um, I'm sure you all know Rupert Murdoch. He's a uh, you know, very good reputation. People generally associate him with being a philanthropist and, uh, you know, uh, Generally good natured and uh, so on. They call him an axe man, isn't it? Yeah. He but, uh, jobs. but I mean, the thing is, like, if there's one person who understands the media sector, uh, in 2011, he made a decision to say, look, no, um, we're going to charge for journalism. <coughs> we're putting up a hard paywall. And overnight, the uh, traffic, the online uh, traffic to the Times and the Sunday Times website, uh, fell 85%. And the view was that, like, that's it. You know, the Times and the Sunday Times just won't survive in the digital age. They can't. But the company said, no, look, this is it. We're going to charge for our journalism. So they put up a hard paywall. And they said, look, we're just going to build up a subscription model alongside uh, sales of our newspaper. So <clears throat> since then, in the intervening period, um, the uh, we've now got globally I think it's about 560,000 digital subscribers. Um, and the aim is to get to a million by 2020. And once we get to a million digital subscribers, that's it, like you've got everything paid for. And then after that, everything you make a profit is through the sales of your physical, uh, your hard copy newspapers, and a number of other different income streams. So a few years ago, they made a decision to open up in Ireland, do an Irish edition. And they did Scotland initially, a separate Scottish edition, and now uh, three years ago. So that's when I joined as deputy editor and business editor. Um, and we were digital only at the start. Last June, um, we launched the print edition. And then last Saturday, we actually relaunched with much more Irish content. Um, so the aim would be to build up our presence in Ireland, both print and digital. Um, and uh, yes, we are employing, uh, you know, taking on reporters, um, at, you know, various stages. You know, we are recruiting, we are expanding. <coughs> we took on four people last week, and um, so uh, that's. Uh, oh, I think that's where I'll wrap up anyway, just okay. in terms of compete round the houses. Okay, thanks, John. That's great. Listen, um, Sort of the, the, the context uh, for you in all of this is that, like John was saying, I mean, you were all very young when the recession started, but the impact that that had is that when you all go out working now, there's always going to be a, a story that has a business element to it that you're going to have to cover. So um, the, uh, what kind of advice would you give them, you know, when they're kind of in a newsroom and maybe they're sent down to, to cover something, like you were saying, you can't be an expert in everything. No, uh, I mean... What kind like, of advice would you give them about that? But, I mean, it's... 
See, the thing is, I, I think it's wrong to see journal, uh, business journalism or financial journalism or economic journalism <coughs> somehow separate to any other form of journalism. It's the skills you acquire. It doesn't matter what sector you're in. Um, that's what you... I mean, okay, like, you will have to develop an understanding of how the economy works. You know, what's the makeup of GDP? Um, you know, the basic... The banking system. <coughs> how does the banking system work? Its relationship with the wider economy, um, you know, like the Department of Finance. What, did, what does the Department of Finance do? <coughs> how does the budget affect my everyday existence? What potential? Uh, what role does it play in the management of the economy? Taxation, all of that. I mean, you will have to develop an understanding of that. But like, it's unrealistic to expect anybody to be an absolute expert in, you know, tax. You know, uh, you know, if you if you change the margin rate of tax to whatever, what impact does that have on competitiveness? Like you're not there to answer that question. You're there to ask that question. And you go I mean I think it's developing an intellectual um, or an academic intellectual basis, an understanding of this <coughs> where you can ask ask the right questions. Um, and I think a big problem in the past is that people just didn't develop that awareness at the start. It was like you asked a question, you were given an answer, and you just printed it. Um, whereas now, the one thing that's changed since the crisis is people are much more critical. Um, okay, you give us this answer, but can you back it up? Um, what if I went to this person? What would they say? Would they contradict you? Um, why? Uh, and there's much more of that going on now. Um, I think business journalism has become much more critical, um, but that's because it has to. And that is back to basic journalism, um, which you could argue was, could have been missing from business journalism from day one. It possibly wasn't as critical as other forms of journalism, whereas it should have been, and it possibly should have been more, um, and now it certainly is. Um, so ultimately it's much more than what you know about the economy, it's more than what you know about how the financial system works. It really is your journalism skills. Okay, thanks. Any questions? Yeah, George. You've got to put on the mic here now. Uh, what are your thoughts on cryptocurrency and where do you see it going in the future? Um, it's like, um, it's a bit like this uh, tulip. Remember the tulip? Well, I won't say remember the tulip craze, but uh, it's the, uh, the first ever. Um, Gold rush, um, or <coughs> first ever buying frenzy, stock market frenzy, um, started in uh, New York, New Harlem, uh, with tulips. You know the price of tulips. There was a like a run in the price of tulips, or the price of tulips went through the roof, and everybody bought into it, and suddenly they collapsed, uh, and people were saying like, well, everybody wants tulips. So, you know, the more you buy, it's, it's good. Uh, and then the price collapsed and people were left with a load of tulips. And they were like, fuck, why did I buy all these tulips? And that was the first ever, you know, if you take it, the psychology behind that. I mean, the thing is, you asked me this, and I can't tell you the answer because nobody will know until after the, fa after the fact. Uh, it's the same mentality with every, um, every rally. Um, take it before... 1929, um, the rally before 1929, everybody bought into the stock market. <coughs> Once you bought a stock, you saw it going up. It was, you know, the means to instant riches. So it was very hard to c come along and tell somebody, look, you know, don't buy into this. They could go down. Nobody wanted to know. It's just that herd mentality. Um, and it's happened so many times. You know, the same with the internet internet bubble. I mean, it was people going out, like it's, it's hard to believe, but it's only like 2001, 2000, 2001, which is 17, 18, 17 years ago. Uh, I mean, stock market valuations. There was this thing called the, the Monday Club in London. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but it's where these tech entrepreneurs uh, would go and they'd meet investors and, you know, they'd match up. But like, 
I went to it once. I was a journalist there at the time, and like, it was just fascinating to watch. Because literally, these guys going in, and they were saying, yeah, we're going to sell like, fruit, but we're going to sell it online. And it was like, fruit.com. And it was like, oh, Jesus, you know, they must be worth 100 billion or something. Um, where it was just one remove from somebody in a market stall in the East End selling fruit. You know, it was like, you know, why, just because you put dot com after it, why did you suddenly become so valuable? But every, that was the prevailing wisdom at the time, or the approach. People just went, right, you know, the road to instant riches. And if you got in at the right time, um, you know, I mean, a, a friend of mine here in Ireland was working for Ireland.com at the time. And it was, you know, it was some internet company. But they had, you know, these things at their desks. And they were all given stock options. Um, and they were all, they had these things, these monitors, just showing how much their stock was going up on a daily basis. Um, I mean, he, Ed was 22 at the time. He did engineering in Trinity. It was a famous company, I can't remember it now, but he went in and like, uh, he was worth, I think, 425,000 at the peak, the stock he had been given by the company. Uh, here he was, 22, he was worth 425,000 uh, based on his stock. Um, now, if he'd sold out, if he'd gone and like, sold his shares, he would have had 20, 425,000 in cash. Now, he asks himself that question every day, why didn't I sell? And he was told, don't, because they're going to go up to a million. So the thing is, the whole thing about cryptocurrency now, I mean, look at the volatility in it over the last few weeks. It'll always come back. Is there a role for it in the longer term? There's an awful lot of hype about it at the moment. But if you look at the technology behind it, blockchain, you know, that is, there's something genuinely innovative about that. And just like there was with the internet, the internet was this model that was, you know, sound. It changed our lives. But at the start, there was this, you know, craziness about it. You know, it was just seemed like this limitless, um, this forum that was absolutely limitless in its opportunities. And if you were able to monetize that, if you had some model around monetizing that, then the sky was the limit. Now, we know that was crazy because the laws of gravity will always apply. And just like with cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, anything, you know, they do apply. And if you look at the volatility in the last few weeks, it goes up like that, it comes down like that. Eventually, it will crash. But underneath it, there is this technology called blockchain. And that's the thing that will survive in the future. And it will revolutionize the way um, currencies work. But I don't think the things around it, like Bitcoin and all those at the moment, I don't think they'll... I mean, they will survive in some form, but they're not gold. Um, and even like, you know, gold rush, gold is gold leader, it goes down as well as up. So. Uh, notwithstanding the fact that Angela Merkel just got re-elected, re um, Europe is, or the European Union is on a shaky foundation for the last number of years. What's your, or what are you hearing about the euro and its long-term survival as a currency? Uh, uh, I you mean, know? like people were predicting the demise of the euro the day after it was, um, like 2012, you know, that was it. Um, you know, single currency wouldn't rather. I mean, every day, and I would say a lot of it, if you look at the, um, the business media in particular, it tends to be anglo centric. Uh, like a lot of it is based in the city of London. A lot of the, like the FT, even though the FT would be very pro Euro um, or pro EU. Um, but I think it's just like, you know, the reason Brexit happened was there was a fundamental misunderstanding, not misunderstanding, but unwillingness to understand the EU if you're in Britain. Um, you know, Britain saw itself, there's always been this idea of British exceptionalism. Um, and that's why they couldn't survive within the EU, because they couldn't be part of 28 member states having <coughs> the same voting rights as Cyprus or even worse, Ireland. Um, you know, this is like, you know, we're an empire. Um, but I mean, take for example, Sterling. Like, is Sterling uh, a good idea? Because if you look at it, Northern Ireland, Scotland, Newcastle, Wales, 
London, I mean, you're talking about economic areas that there's greater inequality than there is anywhere in the Eurozone. Now, the Eurozone definitely had design flaws, but I wouldn't underestimate the, uh, the um, reforms that have taken place. It was, uh, when the Euro was designed, they knew that the architecture needed <coughs> to make the Euro work couldn't be done overnight. Uh, so the idea was that you know, these countries would come together and over time this consensus would develop where you, you know, develop a banking union, where you develop a capital markets union, where you would reform your economy. Um, and all this would happen over you know, the next decade. But when the euro was launched, what happened was you did globalization of money. And um, so like, you didn't have to reform your economy. You didn't have to develop a banking union. You didn't have to develop a capital markets union because you could just get money from everywhere. And um, so what happened, see the thing is the countries within the Eurozone, I, uh, like I mean a lot of people would say, you know, the yard and the Euro was a big part of the reason why um, Ireland's economy became inflated and ultimately nearly collapsed, or did collapse, um, because we didn't appropriate interest rates. But <coughs> that argument is nonsense. Because look at all the countries outside the Euro. Like Iceland, Hungary, all these places. I mean, we were an open economy. We were going to get money anyway. It had nothing to do with the Euro. Now the Euro facilitated it a bit more and was more efficient in terms of how it came in. But I think Ireland, inside or outside the Euro, would have ended up in huge trouble. Now, the fact that we were inside was all the ultimate bailout to us. Um, and I think if you look at the reforms that have happened in the Euro over the last few years, I think there's a bit more to go. Uh, but look at all the people that were four years ago. The prevailing wisdom was the Euro will collapse. It can't survive. Then it was, well, it, it could survive, but it just won't be a great currency. Uh, now it's, well, okay, it's doing better than we expected, but, um, you know, I wouldn't be confident that it'll be here in 30 years' time. But, you know, see, there's a whole generation. I mean, everybody in this room grew up with the Euro. Um, how many people here remember the punt? Okay, yeah. right. <laughs> how many of you want to go back to the punt? Why? Why did? Um, pretty smart currency at the time, like. As I know. Yeah. And, uh, the point was like, like sorry, but like, you know. Like, kind of as well. and, you know, I mean, it's, it's nice to be kind of small bit diverse in the rest of Europe in terms of stuff like that. Yeah, but that's the whole argument behind Brexit. Yeah, and, well, I'm not arguing that's the British choice as well at the end of the day. Yeah, I know, but we, I mean. We don't know what the effects the Brexit is going to have. The, England could have So the dynamic that I see is we're actually negotiating with Britain as equals. Never happened. Go back to the sixties and before, never happened. We were always the, the poor cousin. Now we're actually at the same table with them. Almost no, at the I same mean, like, parallel, I do I do the uh, every Monday I do a Brexit conference call with my colleagues in London, um, which you know our diplomatic editor, our political editor, our business editor, and our correspondents in Berlin, um, Brussels and so on. And I mean over the last year it's the first time Britain has ever had to take Ireland seriously. And I mean seriously. Because as soon as Radker and Coley took over, and they came in and they said, right, quit your messing. Like, what do you intend to do about the border? What do you... The thing is, within the context of the EU, they have, you know, Britain literally by the neck, and they're, you know, tightening the grip. If we were a small independent country, what are the chances of Ireland ever being able to protect its interests? I mean, this whole idea of Ireland, you know, has, has had to give up sovereignty within the EU. I would argue that it's the complete opposite. It's actually strengthened our sovereignty <coughs> because it's through sharing of different institutions um, or the institutional backing of a much, much more, more larger bloc that amplifies Ireland's um, power. And look at it in Brexit negotiations. If Brexit happened and we weren't in the EU, it would have had, hu had huge repercussions for Ireland anyway, and very damaging ones. But what could we have done about it? 
I mean, that. you'd send, I mean, Coveney and Veradka could have gone to London and started pounding and roaring and shouting at them, and they'd been like, oh, fuck off, Paddy. You know, it's like, you know, and that's literally, I mean, behind the scenes, that is the language. Uh, don't believe that it's anything more diplomatic than that. It isn't. But now, because they have the backing of the EU, and when you've Merkel, and when you've John Claude Juncker standing up and saying, look, you better sort out the border or you won't get a deal. But this is the first time like, there is absolute panic in London because they don't know what to do. They thought we would fall over <coughs> in the negotiations in the, in the first round of, I was in Brussels for it. Um, in fact, um, it was my story. I, I broke the story, <coughs> my exclusive about the, uh, the backstop arrangement. Um, but that was presented to London as like, take it or leave it and they couldn't do anything about it. So, you know, this whole idea of, you know, sovereignty, I think, you know, that's... Oh, like it's, we're still at a stage where we don't know, like, obviously it's a different time for Britain at the moment, where we're going, like, they're under serious pressure from the EU and Ireland and everything, but said, we have no idea how, that, how they're going to fare out 10, 15 years down the line. Oh, yeah. <coughs> but what I would argue, what I'd say about that, look at the damage they're doing now Look at the damage they're doing in ten in the next ten years, because I don't see a model. I don't like if you look at you know the, bre the Brexit argument, like that you know let's get out of Europe. We're being shackled to this corpse. Look at the opportunities that awaits us. You know Britannia will rule the waves again. You know we'll be the masters of our own destiny. Look, there'll be trade deals with the rest of the world. You know we'll sign them like that. You know, it was nothing but the golden uplands or the sunny uplands. Brexit has happened. It's happening. And now look at the language. Well, it won't be that bad. You know, okay, we might be poorer, but we get our sovereignty back. I mean, next year it's like, when we hope, you know, fuck. Um, you know what, like, panic is starting to set in. Because that model they promised, the model they thought that they could deliver, just doesn't exist. This whole, you know, how did the British not foresee that it was going to be so bad? Like, did they completely because forget about their border situation? Or? Well, the, see, the thing is, Brexit was, it was never about economics. Brexit is about a mentality. It's literally, it's, I mean, it's like that 60, mm, comment from 1963, the US um, foreign, the US, do I call them the yeah, no, no. Uh, you know, Britain has lost an empire and looking for a role. Mm. Like, the thing is, Britain, there is a mentality in Britain that's never got over the loss of the empire and the loss of its importance as a global leader. It could never handle its status as a second rate country, as being part of the EU. Um, and if you look at all the arch Brexiteers, that was the narrative they sold. Let's make Britain great again. You know, it was literally Empire 2.0. You know, if we leave the EU, EU, suddenly our empire will be back. You know, we'd be great again. But nobody ever explained the economic model. I mean, okay, you'd Boris Johnson going around the country saying, oh, yeah, we've got 350 million a week for the NHS. The reality is that with Brexit, the NHS is probably gone because they'd have to do a trade deal with America, and America would say, the first thing we want is your NHS, privatise it. And instead of 315 million a week to pump into it, you know, it'll be down 100, 200 million a week. Um, there was never a compelling economic argument behind Brexit. And the thing is, it was never fought on that basis. Brexiteers intentionally stayed away from the economy because they knew it was, you know, we would never win the economy. Look at the things they won on. It was migration. You know, it was like dog whistle racism. You know, our country's being flooded. It isn't. You know, but it was things like that. It tapped into people's fears. Uh, it was about fear. It was about reimagining Britain as, you know, a global leader. Um, and, like, the problem with that is, unless every other country in the world decided to rewind the clock 150 years as well, it was never going to happen. You know, people move on. In a way, there was nobody more surprised than Boris Johnson when they won. There's a part of him that would be careful oh, no. what you wish for, isn't there? Oh, no, absolutely. But you mean. It's just a political thing for him. I mean, that, like yeah. the famous clip of him that night, um, you know, going home in the tube, 
when it looked as if you know the yes side would win and Brexit would be defeated. Remember, I don't know if like somebody caught him on the tube, but he looked relieved. You know, he was like, <laughs> you know, dodged the bullet there. Um, and then like you know Brexit happened and he was like, oh, uh, but it was the same with Michael Gove. I mean, they were positioning. Like a lot of those guys were just positioning for the leadership. Um, and it became like they never, ever expected. I mean, it was a bit like Trump. You know, who, like, I mean, you know that Michael Wolff book? Um, I mean, the person who was most surprised at him winning was himself. And like, he really didn't want to win, apparently. You know, he just wanted to go back, you know, being a TV star and whatever, just boosted his ratings. Uh, governing a country was not part of the plan. Uh, and it quite obviously isn't. Um, the, uh, and I mean, again, but the thing is, it was the same forces. Um, and you know, it gets back to the media, like how much we missed. Look at the other side of this. What are the forces that are, since the crisis, what are the forces that are shaping society now? You know, who would have expected like 10 years ago? Who would have thought that in 10 years time the debate that would shape our time would be populism. And what is populism based on? It's on inequality. See, the thing is, when the rising tide was lifting all boats, when the economy was on the way up, that sense of inequality wasn't there because everybody was buying into something. You know, if you could get your leg in the property ladder, it didn't matter if you were working in a job where you couldn't afford that house. Once you got on the property ladder somehow, no matter how, and if that meant borrowing way more than you could afford, you are on the road to riches, so you didn't care. But then on the other side of it, when the property collapsed and people were left with a load of debts, it was inevitable that this anger would be unleashed. And, you know, and it's a sense that, you know, that sense of inequality. Um, and that's what the fallout we're dealing with now, which is shaping the forces behind Brexit, the forces behind Trump. Um, the Democrats just didn't see places like Pennsylvania which they took for granted all their lives. But like all these communities have been completely marginalized. The deindustrialization of the West, nobody knows how to deal with it, and certainly not at a political level. Yeah. Any more questions? Yes, Asana. Yeah. Do you like there? Yeah, thanks. Um, I just wondered if you think the Irish media is better equipped to predict to collapse now when they would actually want to you mean the next one? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to hedge my bets on that. <laughs> yeah, um, Did you hear that question? Is the Irish media uh, better equipped now to predict um, a, a crash? Because the last time, very few journalists were saying it was going to happen. So Simon was just asking. Yeah, well, so I mean... What you're asking, yeah. I'm going to as well. Like, no, but I mean... I mean, everybody will have their... Um, their own, you know, the warning signs. Uh, my one is, if I ever hear the, the term, this time it's different, that's it, <laughs> <laughs> we're fucked. Because like in 2007, uh, when people did start questioning, and you know, the laws of gravity, like if property prices are going up by 15% a year, if the average house price is 10 times more than the average industrial wage, um, you know, if things like this, this isn't normal, you know, and then we were told, yeah, but this time it's different, you know, at that point, people should have known that we should go for the exit signs, but people bought into it. Um, and I think your question about, it really depends on when, um, because if you give it enough distance, people's memories fade. I mean, already we're into another kind of mini property bubble. Now, the reason I, I genuinely wouldn't be as worried um, about the property market now compared to 2007 is because this time it's different. Uh, it's the, uh, no, there are like property prices are going up. Whereas in 2007, it was because of you know, banks were just throwing money. Uh, now you go into a bank and it's actually very hard to get money out of them. Uh, it's not credit fueled. That doesn't mean there isn't a property bubble. But if it bursts, it won't have the same effects. Um, and I think we, I think 
But I mean, who knows, like, go 10 years down the line, people's memories fade. This will have faded. The immediate aftermath of this crisis will have faded. Um, and you know, like, you know, the Glass-Steagall Act was brought in after the, um, the Wall Street crash to stop casino capitalism in the States. It was basically where banks were just, they were like casinos. Uh, where you just went in, got your money, and like placed it on the stock. You'd go to a teller, take out a loan, and they weren't even asking you were you working or anything. It was just giving you the money. Then you'd walk over to the other side of the bank. They had a broken business, and you'd go into a stockbroker and say, "Look, I'm going to put money on this, that, and that." <coughs> and after the Wall Street crash, and they went right. That's it. They brought in this thing called the Glass Steagall Act, which was to separate banking banks so if you're giving out loans and um, you can't have another division of your bank over here which is taking that money and putting it on the market and um, because you've got a complete conflict of interest um, but then gradually over time you know the one thing that banks and all these people are very good at is lobbying so these lobbyists came along they were working capitol hill and they were like is it a bad idea? I mean, we know an awful lot more now. It can never happen again. And gradually, all those laws got repealed. So, you know, in the 90s, noties, you once again had these huge banks with different arms, like they were lending, they were brokerages, all that sort of thing. Uh, and then these banks became too big to fail, except they did fail. And then the taxpayer had to go in and bail them out. So memories fade, and lessons that were learned in the past became come quickly unlearned. Interesting. Can I ask you just one question? Um, uh, you know there was a huge anger with the banks here when they collapsed and um, we had this investigation, bank inquiry and all that. But um, in Iceland they jailed the Prime Minister and there's, you know, a kind of, a, uh, there was a lot of anger in Ireland that the people that were responsible for this, you know, um, very loose regulation they should be prosecuted in some way, or that the bankers should be prosecuted. Um, do you think there's there's a there's a even a political will or anything to do about that, to do anything about that? Now? Yeah. Well, funny. Um, I was reading an article a couple of years ago. Yeah. It was in some English publication, and they were saying uh, they were complaining about you know the banking crisis in Britain and yeah. how nobody has been held to account. Yeah. And they were saying, look at Ireland. Yeah. At least they're putting bankers on trial. Yeah. Now the thing is, we have. I mean, there's. I know we bought drawn back from the states, but it well, I mean, to see what happens with him. No, no, but I mean, Sean Sean Fitzpatrick Fitzpatrick walked. walked. I know, but he walked. Yeah. But you can't blame that on political no, I will. Yeah, I mean, that's the judiciary. The system, yeah. And I mean, the thing is, bankers have gone to jail. Mm -hmm. uh, look at how many of them, like you know, there. I mean, Fingleton is before a tribunal at the moment, which will lead to criminal <coughs> charges and so on. Yeah. So I mean, if you look at all the offending institutions. Um, you know, most of the culprits, certainly around Anglo, have been charged. Yeah. Now, whether they ultimately get sentenced, that's a function of the judiciary and the yeah. legal system, not the politics. Oh, I know that. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I don't think you can accuse the government of lacking the, the courage to. No, in fairness, <coughs> but I suppose I'm just thinking of there was the real public thing of the, wasn't it the Prime Minister of Iceland went to jail? Was yeah, but I mean, I also think that there is an argument to be had in this country about where responsibility ultimately lies. Because you know this whole thing about burn the banker, or yeah. jail the bankers and burn the bond, ho bond holders and all that. I mean, like I know it might seem like an extreme analogy, but you know, it's, like, it's a bit like Nazi Germany. That is an extreme analogy, but uh, you know, it's like, you know the German people after the Second World War was like, oh, we just followed, our, followed orders. I mean, like, there is a sense in this country, everybody partied at the time. Um, I mean, how many people that were well-educated, um, were financially savvy, walked into banks and took out loans, knowing that they couldn't, yes. these didn't make any sense. No, okay, like the banks were willing to give them. Yeah. But on the other side, I mean, how many people went in and just took yeah. out loans that they couldn't possibly afford? No, on the other side of it, how do you portion blame? I mean, are the banks 100% exclusively responsible for this? 
or was the blame much wider than that? And the uncomfortable reality is that it was much wider. Yeah. And, you know, the banks became convenient. I mean, they did do terrible things and they were... But it was, it was a political thing with some regulation and all that. Oh, absolutely. Like, but, I mean, yeah. that's why the blame... You could right, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah it's just it's interesting in the Everybody Parties um, thing, which was a big media team at the time a few years ago, because one of the things about, about people borrowing money at the time the only way to get a house in Ireland at that time was to borrow from a, get a mortgage. There's no social housing. If you rent, you like now, you risk um, eviction at any time. So most people who, if, uh, they say partied, were borrowing money to buy houses to live in. And if they didn't borrow the money to buy the house to live in, they had no other, there was no other options. I mean, see, the thing is, what I would say to that is, look at the political system behind it. Mm. Now, Fianna Fáil had been in power from 1997, but they were, we don't live in a dictatorship. No, they were, re were re-elected three times. The, the general election of 2007, Bertie Ahern was in Dublin Castle a couple of weeks before that election, mm -hmm. and he gave the most outlandish testimony ever. Remember, it was... Yeah, um, you know, like I wanted on the horses, yeah. um, you know, the back of the sofa or something like that. But he came within a whisker of getting an overall majority. No. But you remember the Fianna Gael Labour policies were identical. People didn't know what they were voting for. They had 10 years of Fianna Fáil rule at that stage. This is the society he was delivering. Yeah. And this is what people voted for. But if you remember, Labour and Fianna Gael had identical policies. Exactly. So you can't say that, you know, all these people, there's a lot of people in hindsight claiming, you know, the likes of, I mean, for example, Fintan O'Toole. I really don't remember Fintan O'Toole at the time saying, he was arguing about this, um, how we should s spend the spoils, but he wasn't ever questioning how they were being delivered. But there was a structural element to all know, of this that was but deeply... But I mean, the structural element was because of the political system we had. Mm -hmm. And that had a lot of buy-in from the electorate. Now, ultimately, like if you want to go to a level behind that... I can say but there, is, there is an ideological element that the, the only way that was perceived of being able to buy a house, which was encouraged very much by the media, was to get a private well, mortgage. And it, even, even to this day, like we... we we forget, commercial banks only took over the mortgages in the 80s. You know, it wasn't always yeah, no, the way we I mean, delivered housing. I think you're resting way too much power on the media there. I'm not, not, it's not media things, it's ideological. It's across society, it was in academia, it was, it was right away across, I mean. See, the thing is, like, I mean, it does get back to like, the role of media and the power of media mm -hmm. in society. How powerful is it? Does it reflect society or does it shape it? Mm -hmm. um, or both. And I, yeah, but I mean, it is a combination of both. Mm -hmm. And I think the ability of the media to shape society is... But it, it was interesting, I found, that the, the frame that came out that we all partied was a very convenient way to kind of sh to, to, to declass it, you know, and say, well, this, this was, we all did it. We were all part of it. When the vast majority of... make it untrue? Well, it, it does, because it takes away the class element of it, that there was purple people making decisions and like you talked about earlier, the, the deregulation was a huge part of it. Um, and and the way of, it was kind of like, well, we all partied, it's your own fault, you deserve what? No, I mean, that wasn't my point. Mm -hmm. But, I but it was a key, one no, of the no, big no, frames. I, mean, I think if you're looking for blame, mm -hmm. I don't think you can go to any one source for blame. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's just way too convenient. Like, it started and ended with the banks. No, it didn't. It was regulation, it was a political system. <coughs> It was people buying into that political system. Um, I mean, how you would apportion blame, you know, it was a debate that could last forever more. But I don't for one second buy into this thing that, yeah. you know, I mean, I, I take issue with the whole thing being a class system as well. Well, it was a class system, I and mean, how could you say it wasn't? I mean, but how many people? I mean, even today, it's, it's, just, it's still a class system. Like, if you look at landlordism, yeah, but I mean, are you saying that's... Yeah, but I think you're getting into the realms there of like... I mean, most people buy into this. Now, if we didn't, we could change it. Mm -hmm. But people don't want to change it. No, no, I don't know. I think 
Like, okay, okay, you bring Paul Murphy in here, and he'd say, right, class warfare, you know, like, over their heads, but he's on 3% in the polls. Why is that? I mean, it's not because he's been suppressed by the media. Every time you turn on the TV, he's there. You know, yeah. he's there with that message. But so why isn't he at, like, 40, 50%? Good question. But that's, uh, you know, the chicken and egg of ideology, like where does it come from, how does it, how does it come about? But uh, the point being, like you talked about Trump and Corbyn and everything, that there is big changes. I, I'm, I'm hogging the mic here. I should probably yeah. pass it on. Yeah, I tell you, we, we need to... Sorry. Oh, I have a question. Oh, yeah, do, yeah, do. I'm yeah. an introvert. I'm a project. Yeah. Uh, so I don't have a question. Yeah. Uh, my question is, David Fleming, I'm the assistant dean in the faculty. I really am enjoying the conversation in the seminar. Uh, I was in England last week, and I uh, is really this is a question about your perception of the British media. Mm -hmm. And when I was glancing th through, I think your paper, but the British version, I was surprised. And I have noticed this beyond just looking at one or two issues of the paper and other papers, how how dominant the Brexit narrative has become that there, were, that there are very few voices articulating, bar the Guardian Observer, uh, the Remain side. And yet Remain did represent 48% of the British population, of the United Kingdom population. So re, my, I felt, where, where are these people? Where are the journalists who are articulating the other side uh, well, is that perception a fair perception of the paper? Like, first of all, the British media has always been much more polarised. Um, like, much more so than here. The media here tends to reflect society which is quite centrist. You know, we don't have extremes on either side. You never have, you know, Telegraph, Guardian over here because there isn't the appetite for it. Um, but, I mean, you take newspapers like The Telegraph, uh, The Sun, The Express, <coughs> Daily Mail. I mean, they were tier leaders for Brexit. And they did it from a very ideological perspective. I think it's impossible for them to turn around now. Like, I, I, how would they do it credibly and say, you know, because they're swimming in that 52%, but whatever. But does that mean journalists employed by those newspapers cannot write well, I mean, I, I covered Ireland um, for the Telegraph for all the way through the crisis. Um, and I kept my copy out of the main section as much as possible. Um, because I knew once it went into the business section, it would be kind of reported straight. As soon as it went into the uh, main... The thing is, data view of the crisis where it was all to do with the Euro, they were deeply Eurosceptic. Um, so their copy got changed. And it was all like this kind of, the angle they would pick out would be just, I mean, it would be quite irrelevant to the overall copy, but it was like, you know, Ireland was busted by, a, you know, uh, then, you know, the banks, the, you know, the Euro, like the, the design clause of the Euro, everything, you know, was, uh, and they had one narrative. And if you go into the, um, the newsroom of the Telegraph at any senior level, they all come from a similar background with a similar mindset, and that's why they're employed. I would take exception with the Times. The Times is a broad church, and I mean, I can tell you because I deal every week, but I mean, if you take 14, the Times has 14 columnists, and 13 came out as Remainers, and they're still very much Remain. I mean, take the likes of uh, Rachel Sylvester, Jenny Russell, and Oliver Kahn, and all these people. I mean, every week, they're like saying this is a disaster. There is no upside to Brexit. Um, the editorial line in the Times was a Remain. It advocated a Remain vote. Um, and I mean, I would, I mean, I think the Times, because of its background, it tends to be more London-centric and quite liberal, um, that its readership, I think they did a survey and the readership of the Times is what, 75% remain. And I think that would reflect, I think actually the newsroom would be more than that. I mean, I know one, there's one columnist who's uh, a leave uh, and is still leave. I mean, fuck, the, I mean, Matthew Paris, 
I mean, like he's having a nervous breakdown over leave, and it's like every week. Um, I mean, the editor is an old Etonian um, who I think would be Eurosceptic in the Jerry, Jeremy Paxman's sense that they would have voted to remain, but you know, held their nose and said, oh, well, you know. Um, they still believe in Britain, but they knew from a, at a very pragmatic level that it was you know, ridiculous to leave. Um, the editorial line reflected that a bit, but I mean, if you look at the, most of the people in there, they would have been ideological remainers. And then the Guardian would be much more so than that again. Okay, I, I'm actually going to stop yeah. now, John. Thank you very much. Um, it was really good. Give <laughs>